So normally you guys do a, a reading at these things, and we're going to instead just start this with some conversation. Um, the, uh, the book literally came out yesterday in North America. Is that right? right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I assume not too many of you um, have, have read ahead. So we're, we're not going to do... Um, <laughs> Too much in the space of spoilers, but there's there's already a little bit out there, and um, and uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about some of the the mechanisms within the book at least. Sure. Um, but I think first, uh, a lot of people would love to know, and I know that there's um, you guys met prior to the Mongolia, but worked together on the Mongolia, and then um, and then are here. So maybe say a little bit about the Mongolia and a little bit about your working process that got you to work on a book together. You're looking at me? Yeah. <laughs> I'll take this one because you're going to yeah. deal with a bunch of others. Okay. Um, the Mongoliad was a collaboratively written, serialized bit of alternative historical fiction. Is that, yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah um, That was written by seven folks, Neil, five other males in Seattle, and me. I, I, was, added, <laughs> I was added when they realized they needed a, a little estrogen added to the equation. Um, and uh, we wrote it over the course of approximately a year or a year and a half. And it was originally intended to be uh, just come out online. And then it ended up being published as a trilogy by one of Amazon's uh, imprints, 47N, one of the first, uh, one of the first things that they printed. Um, and then it was followed by a couple of other books that were written by smaller collections of people. Um, but we, what, what was involved in writing it was once a week, the six people in Seattle would get together and hit each other with sticks for a while and then sit around and have coffee and donuts and Skype me in and we would talk about story and uh, figure out who was writing what chapters this month and uh, it was an interesting bonding experience by satellite for me. Uh, and by the end of it, we all still liked each other. So <laughs> Nice. Um, and the... Uh, the origin story of this book um, didn't really come directly out of that, but that was how your first writing experience. How what? How did this start? Yeah, previously we Nikki and I had known each other for a few years because we share uh, an agent and we share an editor. So um, the uh, but yeah, I I came up with the idea for this this story, this world uh, for some reason on. Um, Thanksgiving Day of, I think it was 2013, I just woke up in a, a Comfort Inn on the outskirts of Clinton, Iowa. We, it was a Thanksgiving trip, and I just basically wrote it down. Um, and, um, the, uh, uh, and then um, it, when, when it looked like uh, it was going to turn into a novel project, I, I thought of Nikki right away, because clearly, it's a time travel narrative, and it was going to involve sending contemporary characters back in time to various historical time periods. And uh, I thought it would be a, a, a match for, for what Nikki does. And uh, we had had the experience of working together you know, on, on the other book. And so I knew that, uh, that it was just going to work. And it did. It did. Yeah. The end. Yeah. Uh, and I know that some of these uh, things come from um, kind of esoteric technology research that, that you do, and, and this one and the time travel part is based a, in, in some string of that, as it were. Um, yeah. the, is, when you say this just came to you, is there, was there something that you were working on or, or researching that, that brought you around to it? Uh, I don't know. It was just one of those weird things that kind of popped into my head, but th there was a, there's sort of a connection back to some of the stuff I was thinking about with, uh, with Anathem, um, having to do with the, there's a whole, uh, uh, it, it, one of the things I became aware of when I was working on Anathem is that metaphysics is, is a real thing. It's, it's not just like a quaint old, Thing that people used to do, but there are living metaphysicians who, who do that for a living. And, um, and, and one of the things that they talk about is sort of possible worlds or alternate worlds, and it ends up getting tied in with the many worlds interpretation of, of quantum mechanics on the physics side of things. And so that was just an interesting, it was just interesting to me that, that people could actually sit around and think about that as like a serious uh, topic of of you know of academic study, so um, 
so that that kind of stuck with me, and and um, the uh, and part of what we're doing in this book is um, is playing around with that and trying to eliminate some of the the well-known logical paradoxes and problems that you get into when you're trying to write time travel literature. Uh, so uh, the the rules of the uh, of the game in this book are that first of all the most recent time you can go back to is July 1851. Uh, so we get rid of the whole, why don't you go back in time and kill Hitler thing. We don't, don't even have to, to talk about that. Uh, and, then, um, the, uh, uh, and then the other thing is that there's multiple strands. So it's not just one past that leads to our future, but there are many different uh, slightly different versions of the the, the past um, that uh, that get to vote on what their common future is going to look like. And so, if you if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to go back and kill Hitler's great 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 grandfather, you could do that. But you'd have to do it 20 times in different versions of the past in order for it to stick. Right. Right. So it makes it it, it creates a cost to. Yeah. Those efforts that are that become increasingly difficult, and also when you go back that that far and you have you change one variable, the repercussions spread out in a bigger way. So, right. right. So you, you can't go back in time twenty years or thirty years and invest in Microsoft stock or, or something like that. Uh, you could go back to the eighteen twenties and buy whale oil futures or something, but. Tracing that through to a, a, an economic benefit today, you know, is a less certain proposition. And Nikki, the, uh, I think what's interesting about this this book and uh, that it's coming out also in such in a way in proximity to Arrival coming out that the one of the, the lead heroine is a linguist um, and the. Um, you know that in, in, in both cases, in a way, the government helicopters land and say you're the most important person in the world right now. <laughs> I hadn't thought um, about that. That's true. <laughs> and, um, and I realize that they're not they you know they don't share much other than that. But I think it's it's curious that we have this. And you know, the, one of our projects are, is around uh, linguistics, the Rosetta Project, where we've been trying to catalog all these things. And so, um, heroes that are linguists are are important to us, but I'm wondering where where the hero linguist part of this came from in your guys' process. Neil, Neil, that was part of Neil's initial image of it, and she has to be the hero linguist in order for the story to work. I was delighted to be given that as a character whose voice could evolve. Um, she, I, anything that I would say about like why that might be happening, why there's the rise of like the kick-ass female linguist would be specious and you know, <laughs> superficial, so I, I won't go there. But you could there. get away with it. I could get away with it. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, clearly, like, we're in a world where the more we communicate, the more distant we, f you know, the usual tropes. Um, uh, did I answer your question? No, I just, I just find it interesting that, yeah, that we have, uh, that, that now... It's great to get to Now female linguists that, yeah. are, and historical I, linguists are the, are the heroes of I'm, our, I'm not of our ling action movies. I'm not a linguist, but I was a nerdy enough kid involving language that when I was a kid, like, I would read nerdy, like books about where language comes from. And I don't think w I made as much use of it as I would have liked to, but there's little places where the fact that I know a little bit about little bits of language kind of work their way in. And um, given the opportunity, I'd certainly do more of that. Well, and you should mention the, the reader of the audio book. Oh, yes. So, um, Small World Department, the, uh, my college roommate uh, and best friend was a Harvard linguistics major. And the character in the book is a Harvard linguistics major. And after being a linguistics major, she went on to become an actress and a voiceover artist. And she is voicing the Harvard linguistics major. So <laughs> I'm very happy about that. And she sounds nice. great. So That's awesome. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we arranged this event a little bit late. And I got my advanced copy um, digitally. And I was like, I was, oh, maybe this is a shorter book. And um, <laughs> uh, so you know, I'm halfway through now. And I realized as it, you know, when you, when you get your book on your Kindle, you never really kind of know how long, how long it is. It is and, yeah. But after four days of reading, and I'm 40% the way through, I was like, oh, no, it's one of those books. And, and so and I, it's exciting that I've been, and I've been going through it. But uh, you tend to write long books, and, and, and now, you, you, now in, even too. in collaboration, you're <laughs> writing long books. Um, 
in an increasing culture where we have shorter uh, form things. And I'm, uh, I wonder how that's you know, working for you. Um, and the, do, do you always want to write long books, or, or uh, how does that work? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's what I do. It's not, it's not a matter of wanting to, necessarily. But it's, um, I think you know, I, uh, my uh, observation is that, um, first of all, there's uh, plenty of long books that appear to do quite well and end up on bestseller lists. And, and get adapted into TV shows and movies. So, um, so clearly there is a market for for great big long books. And um, I think the people who uh, who read them um, enjoy the sort of indulgence of total immersion, prolonged immersion in a big complicated world. And I think that explains why long form television has become you know yeah. an overwhelmingly popular and successful medium in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, uh, is precisely because people kind of revel uh, in the opportunity to get lost in a great big fictional universe. And I, the more that we become like the, the land of tweet, Twitter, the, the more that there is this sort of, broke, that ADD is sort of celebrated and, and found useful, um, the more we need the long form stuff to counterbalance that, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, we also see, you know, podcasts, obviously, that can be hours long um, that are uh, becoming more popular, not less popular. So there seems to be some divergent set of uh, I, the I forms think humans are wired to want that, to get through the long winter nights and so on, and that, and that it, that's, in a way, just something inside of us is craving that enough that culturally we're returning, we're moving in that direction while we're also going in the other direction to balance it out. Also, within the book, it's an epistolary novel, so there's many different voices that are, that are telling the story, and some of the, some of the storytelling happens in very, very short bites. There, I don't think there's, there's no Twitter in it, but there's, um, there's, there's some Slack conversations, yes. there's, there's like inter-office memos There's and Slack, stuff, there's so. the equivalent of, of Slack messages, so, so basically of Twitter-like length, but then, that's interspersed with much longer narrative uh, pieces. Yeah, it's not 750 probably. pages of... Slack. <laughs> Slack. 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 Yeah. But there are some long, there's some very long letters from the past. Yes. 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 Um, and you don't mention the mechanism of those letters, at least not yet. Um, are they, are they coming forth uh, as, as things from the past or are we reading them um, or, or would that be giving away too much? Because I, I haven't gotten that part. I don't part. think that it gives anything away. That yeah, I, I think the overall conceit of the book is that this is an archive of, yeah. of stuff that was leaked. Right. From the, the uh, from the uh, the servers, you know, of this fictitious organization, and someone's gone through and curated it and, and pulled out enough uh, uh, samples from that that big archive to, to to tell a coherent story. And so, in some cases, you're reading transcripts of ancient documents that have been recovered and you know scanned, and in other cases, it's just direct downloads of you know a Slack thread or something. And I, I, I felt a, an interesting link to actually one of your shortest books. First, there was the command line. There's a, there's an, a, a funny bit about operating systems and interface uh, in, in this one. Um, does it have a backstory at all, or not really? They're, they're well. They're using a, a, a operating system called Shiny Hat, which is. Um, the, the most secure, geeky operating system in the world, and it only works on the command line because mice and all that are, are insecure. And so it's kind of created by the most paranoid OS geeks on Earth to, uh, so that they can be safe from government surveillance. And so as soon as the government becomes aware of it, they just buy them out and adopt the the operating system because it's so cool, and that's the the operating system that is now used internally uh, by this top secret government organization. Uh, but I, I don't know; it's just a, a throwaway joke because because one of the one of the things that comes up when you're writing this kind of book is that you know you want to throw in some technical details like you know what kind of computers do they use, what kind of operating system do they use, and anything that I put in is going to be wrong. Right. You know, if I just quote, a, mention a specific real operating system or what have you, so it's more fun to just make something up. Nice. Um, we're going to open up to questions. Um, 
in just a second. But yeah, I, th I think the the other um, what it turns out I guess was not a was, was also a fictitious bit was uh, a brewery that's that's used. But the um, in in our research for creating this place, one of the things we learned is that some of the oldest companies uh, that are in continuous operation tend to be breweries, bars, hotels, um, and uh, and that. That comes up here, and it also goes back to the name of it. It was a was a linguistic thing that you found oh, as well. Oh, Tearsheet. Tearsheet. Tearsheet, uh, which I named after Doll Tearsheet, who's a character who's a prostitute in the Henry plays Shakespeare's Henry plays Henry the Fourth. But it is also just a. He wasn't being terribly original when he used it. If you know what prostitutes do, all you have to do is think about it, and Tearsheet is makes a lot of sense. So the, 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 the story is that... It took a minute, the, but you got it. Some of the action takes place in, in Elizabethan London and is centered on the old Tearsheet Brewery, which is sort of adjacent to a, a theater. So, um, Thank you for that context. Yeah, now it makes that. more sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have uh, mics for questions, or are we... Yep. All right. We have one up front. <laughs> Nikki, I have a question, and maybe for both of you, a question on research for historical novels now. And I guess you've been at it long enough to be have done it back pre-web, and you sort of have to wander around Wales and stuff like that. But that was so much richness on the web. How has researching an historical period for fiction changed over time? You know, I, I haven't really changed my methods at all because the more information there is on the web, the more unreliable information there is on the web. So I, I usually will, um, between real libraries and what I can find on Google, sort of get a very, very superficial level of uh, like, hmm, what is there to look at? But you either want to go on site or try to go to to closer to preliminary sources, you know, prim primary sources, to get the material. I, I just, the, yeah, the more there is, the less you can trust of what there is. That's well, you mentioned last night that when you were working on Fool's Tale, which is set in medieval Wales, you basically read everything yes. that existed on that time and place. Because there was a finite amount. There still is a finite amount, but I bet if you went on the web, it would seem like there was three or four times as much. And uh, did you do some traveling for this one? No, um, and so we cheated in a sense, and like for instance, we wanted, uh, we knew that we needed a medieval, there's a, the, one of the storylines is medieval, and we wanted it to be a medieval setting where there was a lot of fighting, and my novel Crossed is about the Fourth Crusade, so I suggested that we make the thing that the fighting is about the Fourth Crusade. So then I didn't have to travel, because I traveled 10 years ago for that one, and I <laughs> still have all my notes. And, Right, um, and then and you have some background in medieval sword fighting, as well. Yeah, so some of that finds its way in. There's a whole um, uh, they they end up having to create a department in the organization called Doves, the Department of Violences and uh, Ethnology, uh, because um, the uh, um, it's not just enough to know a particular historical sword fighting style, but violence or the willingness to use violence and use a, a particular weapon in particular circumstances is, is very much a, uh, it's a very much a social construct, right? I mean, it's, uh, there are certain rules about uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, um, and uh, if you're going back in time, you have you, know, it's, you can't just be a berserker swinging a sword around, but you've got to know what, for example, there was a rule in some medieval societies that if you drew your sword more than three fingers width out of its scabbard, that that was essentially a, a threat of, of violence. And so, uh, so at that point, you're justified. You, you can, first of all, you can be arrested, but uh, if, if you're or square... Or, right, you could be could be arrested by the authorities or, or killed by the other person, and so there was, you know, a certain amount of this sort of you know trying to to goad the other it's person. Two and a half inches. Yeah, right. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that you would have to know. So in the in the book, this fictitious government organization ends up having a whole staff of people that just sits around and studies that kind of thing. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in uh, writing the Mongolia that you alternated chapters or had 
divide it up by chapters. Can you talk more about how you co-authored this particular work? I mean, did you divide it up that way? You developed a character? It wasn't nearly as structured. We just didn't, the question, oh, you can hear it because it's on the mic. Um, it, it, we just wrote what needed to be written when it needed to be written. <laughs> we, we have, we've realized, Nikki and I have realized that we need to make up a whole bunch of fake stories about all the drama and tension and excitement of, of trying to work together because <laughs> <laughs> in reality, you know, she would just go write a bunch of stuff and then I would, she'd mail it to me and I would work on it and it just worked. There was, like, <laughs> you know, was like no stories to, to tell uh, at all. Uh, but so, so, so she would write, she would typically go ahead and write a chunk of it, send it off to me, and then make my pass through it while she was working on the next bit. And um, we used a spreadsheet to keep track of chronology, and that's pretty much all there was to it. It's a very confusing, because of the rules, of time travel for this particular story. The chronology gets very, very complicated. And the, but the, the chronology was about as officially organized as we ever got. We had to make, we had to make shit up like the, um, something called UDET, which is Unity of Doer Experienced Time. So if, if you're the doer, the diachronic operative, you're the agent, and you get sent back on a, a mission that takes three days, do you come, when you come back to the present, do you, do you show up three days after you left? Or could you come back the moment after you right. left, right? Uh, and, um, and then how much have you aged if you were to do that? Right. You, yeah, then you get into sort of the thing. problems like you could have somebody, uh, you know, go off on a 70-year mission and come back a microsecond later and they would have aged by 70 years in a microsecond, which that seems wrong. And so we had to, to so we've got uh, somebody writing a whole little mini dissertation embedded in the book explaining why you can't do that. And it's called, it's called Unity of Doer Experienced Time, or, or you dead. And what, one thing we haven't mentioned here, which does appear early in the book, uh, just like the basic kind of premise of time travel, um, is, the, is magic. Um, and this, the whole, the, the, the year at which that you can go back and the way time travel works is intertwined with magic. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about where magic and, and science cross over here? Um, uh, the simple answer is that it, you, a witch has to perform magic for time travel to happen. But because Neil Stevenson is involved with this book, there is, of course, a scientific explanation for how magic happens. Um, and it makes perfect sense when you read the book. Nice. <laughs> All right. So there are, wait, I can add a little more. Oh, okay. I can be slightly less flipped than that. No, that's, um, that's great. There is, there is a reason that magic used to exist and no longer exists, and it has to do with the effect that technology has on magic, which if we were reading the section that we, were, that we read at bookstores, it, that's the section that we, where we talk about that. Um, so come to the bookstore tomorrow night. Right. Well, yeah, there'll be um, versions of those readings abound. We have a, the mic in the back, and we'll bring it to the front. Yeah, thanks. Um, my question is, about, is also about your writing process. How do you go from a world or a technology or an idea to explore um, to a character-driven story with a plot? Or, or does that all come together? Um, blank stares. Uh, it's, <laughs> we, we don't actually know how it's done. It's magic. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's always a compulsion or a requirement to have a good yarn with some interesting characters doing interesting things, and it all boils down to that. And sometimes you start with with that, with a you know, a, a, an idea for a story or a story event and build on that. Other times, maybe there's an idea for a world. Like in this case, I think it started out with an idea for a world, and then the uh, where it came from or how it got started is the story that we, we invented to, uh, to support that. And to the degree that I have an actual answer to that, um, my background's in theater. I grew up acting and became a director, and so I think in terms of character most of the time anyway, so that's the most 
I, I can come up with characters more easily than I can come up with plot or structure, so it was awesome that Neil had this idea for this story because all I had to worry about was filling in the characters. Interesting. Over here? Right here. Hi, I was wondering about the idea of uh, temporal cultural dislocation. Like, when you think about time travel, have you, you must have thought about how far back within one sort of native culture you could go in time before you become non-functional. Have you had any interesting thoughts on that? When you say non-functional, do you mean that the culture is not functional or no, that, that you, you are you not? you can't function you within the culture. Well, you need to, uh, to the degree that it's possible, that part of the huge government bureaucracy involves a bunch of hazmas, historical, uh, historical, <laughs> Historical Operations Operative. Subject Matter Authorities. There we go. Yeah. Oh, okay, that, thank you, yeah. that, that clarifies who, it. Who prep you to the degree that it is at all possible. So it's a weird, the, the, it's a weird combination of like SEAL Team 6 training camp with a liberal arts college and a, a renaissance <laughs> fair. Yeah. Yeah. Where do I sign up for that? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And, and also almost astronauts too, right? There's the, I think, and just along those lines, getting into the part of what, what's your gut flora contam and your virus right. contamination going back and forth in time uh, becomes a really interesting question, just like kind of the decontamination of the astronauts it, it, and new world travelers. Um, so there's, there's a physical side to it as well as the, the social side. Right. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons that an important character is is a linguist is because the like the, the the most obvious and superficial answer to the question you asked is well you'd have to speak the language right and then of course that's just the scraping the the surface beyond that you'd have to to know so the first thing that that the linguist character does is go back to colonial boston in 1640 so the language there's something of a language change right which isn't a terribly difficult thing to, to deal with, but there's all of this other stuff that she has to know. Yeah, from how she dresses to what the social norms are, body language, how you even hold yourself. If you're wearing a corset, if a woman is wearing a corset, she's gonna carry herself differently and have different sets of muscles that are stronger or weaker because she's being supported in a different way that sort of thing. But because it's, she lives in Boston in the 21st century, that's a fairly easy um, des destination, time, and place, DTAP is the term. That's a fairly easy DTAP to prepare for. And then it just sort of gets further and further afield from there. Yeah, her danger is often around just being a woman walking around yes. unescorted. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, which was clearly different. Carrying in those a centers. shovel. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm sort of building on your question or your answer about the sort of tech, thinking through the technology of, of time travel and so on. There, there's a, lots and lots of novels in science fiction about time travel. Do you try to in any way either rectify it with respect to other choices people have made or comment on other choices people have made or in any way develop any kind of association of that sort or is it just... No, we just say yeah. it's magic and... Once you, essentially they, they figure out a way to get magic working again by making a kind of Faraday cage that within which a witch can do magic. And then <clears throat> it turns out that um, most of what they can do is not that useful. It's like, where did I leave my keys? You know. Uh, I have a headache. I have a headache, you know. Um, so it's uh, uh, a lot of the things that, that that magicians might have done in the past that seemed really valuable at the time are things that we can do a lot better today. So it's a little bit underwhelming at the beginning. Uh, and then they realize, then, oh, by the way, I can send people back in time. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, right? so it's just sort of thrown out there without any attempt whatsoever to explain any, you know, it's just magic. It's just something they can do. Um, I've got a quick question, but uh, after I ask it, catch my eye if you've got a question. We've got, uh, I'll pass the mic to you next. Um, and yeah, you're, you're next there. Um, so can you say something about, you, you, uh, Neil, you write a lot about scientific, exactly researched scientific things, and then also you make up your own rules on some things. Can you say 
what you whether it's more fun to like research and figure out oh how can I do that is that possible is it more challenging is it what what are what are the differences between kind of making up your own rules and then having to follow them mm -hmm. versus uh, the natural science stuff I, I think the key to it is having some rules and kind of sticking with them um, it's not whether or not those rules are terribly scientific isn't as important right so if you watch Star Trek it's just full of complete hogwash from a science point of view but but nerds like it anyway because it's consistent hogwash right so um, uh, so as long as you don't give readers the sense that you're sort of breaking your own rules uh, for your own convenience as a writer then uh, I think you've got satisfied uh, readers and so in this case, you know, as I, as we've been saying, the effort was to create a set of rules around magic and time travel that that we would then try to stick with in a consistent way through the book. And when we encountered places where we were violating our own internal consistency, we would just use that as a springboard in trying to solve it. Usually, it allowed us to come up with new storylines that went in new directions, so. Um. Like the biome thing that, that you brought up, uh, you know, we kind of realized halfway through that, wait a second, uh, there would be contamination both ways, right? So uh, anybody in this room going back to some previous time could trigger a plague wherever they landed, because we've got germs that people in the DTAP aren't, uh, uh, don't have immune systems against, uh, but likewise, uh, we might get sick from their germs. And so, uh, it, so in order to address that, you know, we have to we had to come up with the notion of a whole sort of bio uh, containment protocol and a whole separate research arm of this organization that just kind of works on that problem. And that gave us some fun scenes yeah. in the book that wouldn't have been there otherwise. So, um, so as story, uh, as yeah, as storytellers, um, you guys talked about kind of the this story being a bit piecemeal and, and kind of broken up into different sections or bite sized little bit piecemeal. Um, some are bite sized, some are quite long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm curious if, if, like, if there was a process around how you organized that so um, that there was kind of a, a consistency or a thread that pulled you through each, each story element um, and, how, and like, maybe the process around how that worked for you guys. For me, it felt pretty intuitive. How would you? I think it's kind of an in, sort of an instrumental thing that uh, the epistolary format makes it really easy to fast forward, right? So. Uh, if you're trying to tell things in a linear way, you're, you, you, so it's hard to, to so jump into, engage the hyperdrive and, and summarize a lot of stuff quickly. Uh, so um, whereas if you can just terminate a, a document and then jump into an email thread or something that happens a year later or what have you, then you can just kind of fast forward through a bunch of intervening narrative that um, that wouldn't have been that engaging to read, you know, if you, it was all written in a, a direct narrative style. Um, so I think that was, uh, I think a feel for pacing and when to jump ahead um, was, uh, was a big part of that yeah. decision. Yeah, but also at a certain point it sort of became um, almost like a game to see, game's not quite the right word, but it became fun to see what options we had for that kind of storytelling. Um, so there's a, there's a piece of poetry that when we started writing it, I would not have guessed would be in the book. It's, and there it is. And it works. <laughs> nice. Do you have any more questions? Oh. I obviously yep. haven't read this. So uh, the question may be off, but there's sort of a trope used frequently in science fiction and alternate, alternate histories. For example, I think I'm remembering this correctly, in Steinbeck's Arthur, he goes Aim back. the mic at your face. Yeah. <laughs> he, he goes back and he, um, he knows when an eclipse is going to happen and he gains power from that prediction. Or you have some technology which you leverage in your past. Star Trek does this too. You have something on yeah. everybody. Um, 
from what I'm hearing from you, it's almost sort of like deliberately the opposite, where you it have is, to learn a lot of things about yeah. culture and stuff in order to succeed. In it the is past. deliberately the opposite, because the, there's another rule I forgot to mention, which is that if you make huge changes, oh. like go kill Napoleon, it creates a complete disaster. And so uh, it's all butterfly effect machinations, right? And so uh, like somebody might get um, sent back to a pub in Belgium in 1512 and say, you know, there's a big redheaded guy sitting at the corner table. Your job is to spill his beer and then get out. That's all, you know, or, or uh, open the stable door uh, and, and run away. That, that's your whole mission, right? You're going to train for this. And for do it year. 20 times. Yeah, do it right. 20 times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in different versions of the, the, the past. So, so it's kind of a deliberate flipping of the sort of heroic uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's court version of things where you, 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 you can't do that. You're not allowed to, to make those big changes. And instead, you're this kind of furtive uh, creature uh, who sneaks in and, you know, like unfolds the napkin or you know, does something like that and then gets out. And the, re the, the, reason I, the, the reason I asked is that you're both really interested in history, which is not directly science fiction. You were more science fiction before. So there's sort of a historiography in here that's built in and thinking their small interventions have big changes. I think that's true in real history. Right, so if you just say, you know, Portuguese got spice, or like these, they're actually pretty small, but they have these giant economic consequences. <clears throat> what are you trying to say with that mechanism? I don't want you to out the book, but like by using that, what are you trying to say about history if you're are willing to talk to more something? broadly by making the napkin? Yeah, we're not trying to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're just telling a story. Yeah. Well, I think a, a good, uh, crossover point here is uh, where science fiction and history meet and obviously time machines are an awesome one uh, mechanism as it were and this just last week we had James Glick talking in effect about the history of time machines and had the the literary kind of origins of them um, did you dive into some of these versions of other time machines or um, I, I didn't. Did, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, no. was, was, yeah. <laughs> I did once we finished it, just out of curiosity. Like I really deliberately kind of tried to stay pristine in in our understanding of what we were doing. Then afterwards, just out of curiosity, I read other time travel stories just to see how other folks had done it. And um, I, I think we have more rules than most people. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I did see that Jim Glick had that book out, so I should check that out now. Yeah, his talk is on our podcast shortly, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. and you, you would enjoy the book, I think. Um, another co-authorship question. Both of you are professional writers. You're managing your writer's voice. You've really developed that skill over time. What's involved in sort of blending your writer's voice so that I, as a reader, can't tell when, when you're writing or when you're writing that it's all one story? I, I Please correct me if you disagree with what I'm about to say. Um, I think that because I started doing the fir like I was I was the first boots on the ground, mm -hmm. that the the main narrator's voices I sort of started, mm -hmm. and Neil started voices that came later in the book, and then I think we just mimicked when we needed to. Uh -huh. If he needed to change something that Mel was saying, Mel's voice was strong enough that he could do that and there's a character that shows up later named Mortimer and when Mortimer, when I needed to change something of Mortimer's, I tried very hard to just make it sound like Mortimer, which Mortimer had a clear enough voice that I could do that. So for your next project, you can write a Neil Stevenson novel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to do our last few questions and we'll move on to the inscription part of the afternoon. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. It, it sounds like it was a lot of fun to play with the social norms of past cultures. Uh, and I'm sure the reader kind of reflects on today as a result of looking through those past lenses. At what point in the process did you say, oh, that's a fun and interesting mechanism? Was that built in from the beginning, or did you just kind of arrive at it? You mean using the premise of time travel to comment on 
the quirks of different cultures? Yes. I think you have to think about how quirky all culture is if you're going to put yourself outside of it to, to write about it, even your own culture. And beyond that, I would say it just kind of emerged directly from the specific story that we were telling and the, the, the places that we were sending our, our, our characters. Uh, so uh, it was uh, probably the biggest single extended chunk is in Elizabethan uh, London, which, um, which Nikki knows a lot about because she's a Shakespeare geek. And so, um, so there's sort of a lot of behavioral detail and cultural detail in there that I would not have known about. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, I give you the chance, either the chance or the always the worst question for an author is what's coming up next. But um, do you, uh, separately or together, are there projects that that uh, that you do have coming up in the future that you do want to talk about? Uh, separately, we're. I mean, we had a great time working together, but it's not you know, our natural state is to withdraw to our caves and <laughs> be alone. So um, I'm well along in another book that has nothing to do with any of this, and hopefully it'll be here. done. Yeah, by the end of the year. All right. Question. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, uh, did you have a linguistics consultant for the book, and how did you choose them? If so. Careful, this is a linguist asking the question. We, <laughs> we, so I hope we, you the right one. <laughs> we got a really pointed questioning on this front from a, a University of Washington linguist uh, on our first night of the, the tour who badly wanted us to know that uh, linguists aren't just people who translate things. And, uh, and so the, um, and kind of, I guess the funny part, if you want to think about it th this way, is that when Mel is initially recruited, it's some dude from the government who, who thinks that way. So like, I need a bunch of stuff translated. That's what you do. Here's some money. Please do it. And then kind of a lot of what the story is about is it's her the, growing outside of that. Uh, so. but and using and the other character realizing how much more valuable yeah. the linguist is in all yes. the other parts. So yes. yeah, so I think it, it, it does a good justice to this. Because Laurence, my, my friend from college who's voicing Mel, because she does have a degree in linguistics, when she read it and did not come back to me and say, yeah, you know, you really screwed that up, that just her not saying that made me feel like, okay, dodged a bullet there. Um. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Nice. Uh, do you have any questions from the live stream, or should we move to our next phase? I haven't. I don't. I, there's one follow-up. Uh, Neil, you were here two years ago for, for Seven Eves, and you mentioned at the very end that you had already started working on your next project. So is, is this the project, just to connect the dots, is this the project you had already written a couple hundred pages of? Um, or is it the one that's, uh, that's forthcoming it's still? Probably, yeah, it was probably this one. Yeah. And yeah, I would say so. uh, can you say anything about, since we, uh, going back to Seven News for a second, would you say something about the reception of that? Obviously, uh, some made the Bill Gates and, and Obama uh, list. Any, anything uh, to share about what that feedback has been like, or are there reflections on it now? Uh, it happened. Uh, it was really cool that it happened. Uh, it didn't, um, you know, I didn't have any, the, the Obama thing was a surprise. That it's not like the, it's not like I heard from the White House, you know, or anything like that. It just showed up on the list. And in in the Bill Gates case, we ended up doing a video together, uh, which was a pretty crazy morning, of <laughs> driving around Seattle in a Tesla, pretending to have a a. Uh, an unscripted conversation about the about the book, which it was unscripted. I can de definitely say that. But so there's, if you look, there's a an amazing 360 video that uh, his staff put together for his blog, uh, which um, which records that. Um, but um, you know, uh, it it was uh, it was obviously cool and good that the. Uh, uh, book got that kind of reception, um, and it's the kind of thing that I try to not think about and just keep my head down and keep keep writing new stuff. You know. 
Thank you. Um, well, I want to thank you guys um, for uh, adding us to your insane schedule um, coming through here and, um, oh, and sure. do Thanks. encourage um, um, the people here to, to do, either go to the reading or now that you have the book, you can read the part of that reading. Um, we're going to set the room up. Okay. Sorry. Oh, are you, no. uh, are we, yeah. did you have a question from the? Oh, we, well, we, do, we, did have, uh, we did have maybe one last question. If, uh, oh, okay. Um, I was curious, uh, you mentioned sort of realizing the biome thing halfway through. Um, out of all the issues that time travel brought up, which was the one that was the kind of like, or like if you had one, the sort of like, oh crap moment that required like sort of stopping for a week and like thinking through. Um, I don't think we ever had to stop for a week, but. <laughs> what, so what was the, uh, I, I, I got that, but what was the, the actual? What was your most was difficult yeah, wh time what, travel out of, problem? Out of all oh. the like issues that time travel brings up, which was the one that was like the hardest that required the most sort of thought and. Um, I think once we had the basic rule set in place, I mean that was that was important. The UDET thing was was important. Uh, just set, you know, setting a few other rules like that. Uh, it, a lot of it was just sort of adapting as we as we went along. I don't know why I'm talking about it. So, um, thank you guys. As you know, Neil, uh, you probably already have one of these, but uh, to add to your collection of challenge coins, all of our speakers, and Nicole, this one is thank yours. You. Thank you guys Thanks. for coming by. This and is number three. <laughs> number three, yes, you have a big collection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, have some patience while we reset the room. Yep. And uh, one more, um, well, let's have a big round of applause for, for Xander and for, for